Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. Spins a web any size, catches seeds just like flies. Look out, here comes the Spider-Man. Spider-Man first debuted in 1962 in Amazing Fantasy issue 15, and quickly became one of Marvel's most beloved and iconic characters. Today you'd be hard pressed to find someone who didn't know the story of Peter Parker and Spider-Man. After all, comic book characters and superheroes have taken on the role of modern mythology in a way their creators probably never intended. The characters have been rebooted and reimagined many times over the decades to keep them relevant. Because, like mythology, these stories were not static. They ebbed and flowed as the years went on. Aspects were discarded while others were added in. There are Greek myths. We know them so well now. They have outlived the intent of the original. And there are people who grew up with them, seven-year-olds who are 57 now. They don't want to throw them away, but they want to interpret them through the lens of their own time. While being well-known and beloved isn't necessarily what makes many superhero characters inhabit the roles of modern mythology, many of them have incorporated mythological ideas into their stories over the past few decades, and many since the beginning. For example, Superman is not only the ideal of the self-made small-town immigrant who comes to represent the higher ideals of American society, his story is full of Christian allegories as well. Peter Parker and his alter ego represent the power of youth and the trials in coming of age that many superhero stories don't represent, and didn't before he arrived. Mythological ideas are found within the DNA of almost every Spider-Man interpretation out there, specifically the Campbellian hero's journey. Mythology represents the ideas of the society that birthed the stories, but it's also about change. Much like the stories change with the times, the heroes also evolve to fit within the current world they inhabit. This is what makes Spider-Man such a compelling character, especially for younger people. He becomes a hero in a time of change that everyone experiences, young adulthood. Brings me to the film Into the Spider-Verse. On top of being one of the greatest comic book films ever conceived, Spider-Verse does something incredibly interesting that no other comic book film that I'm aware of ever has. Spider-Verse not only directly references the Campbellian hero's journey or the monomyth in its text, but also connects them to the larger idea of Spider-Man, not as a comic book character, but as a mythic hero. The Hero's Journey was first popularized by writer Joseph Campbell in his 1949 book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. In it, Campbell compares many mythological tales from around the world in order to find common threads and ideas among the stories of many different cultures. The Hero's Journey, or the monomyth, isn't a story skeleton as many people would have you believe. Anyone who tells you that probably hasn't read it, and just in case you were wondering, Here's my copy of The Hero with a Thousand Faces, with chapter markers and highlighted sections and everything. I have read it multiple times. The monomyth is on one hand, a chart of common story tropes and beats that is detected in cultures, stories, and mythologies from around the world. The other is the philosophical idea that we all live our own hero's journey as we go through life, and that these stories were meant to help guide us. The stories that often follow the beats of the monomyth are ones in which the main character or the hero must shed their old, safe life and enter the world of the adults, gaining some newfound wisdom or power, but also losing something in return. It has always been the prime function of mythology and right to supply the symbols that carry the human spirit forward, in counteraction to those that tend to tie it back. Campbell believed that mythology was an important part of society, and how they initiate new members into adulthood. The acts of heroism themselves being metaphors and allegory for the struggles and trials we all go through as we exit childhood and become an adult. So what does this have to do with Spider-Man? 
Well, comic books have long been called modern mythology, and with the rise of things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the origin stories of characters like Batman and Superman being as well known around the world as they are, this description is more apt than ever before. But it was just as true back then as it is now. Comic book characters have long borrowed ideas from mythology. What makes Spider-Man a little more unique is that the character and his origin story mimic beats of the monomyth perfectly. Even across decades of adaptations, Spider-Man retains these ideas in its DNA, and in Into the Spider-Verse makes them explicitly part of the narrative. So, now that we have a general understanding of what the monomyth is, let's talk about Spider-Man, the character, and Into the Spider-Verse, the film, and how they incorporate Campbell's ideas. Campbell's monomyth is broken up into various stages and trials that take place during a hero's adventure into adulthood. Not every hero's journey will hit all of these steps, but many of the larger beats appear in stories time and time again. First up is the ordinary world. This is where we first meet the hero. It's their normal, their comfortable setting from which they eventually are pushed out of it. Then comes the call to adventure. This is when the hero receives some knowledge or power or quest ushering them to the outside world. Then we meet the mentor. This is usually a character that offers advice or a boon to the hero to help them take the first steps on their journey. Then we have the actual crossing of the threshold, where the hero steps outside the ordinary world and begins their adventure. Then comes a series of quests or feats called Tests, Allies, Enemies. Approach the inmost cave and the ordeal, which represent various stages and conflicts throughout the adventure. Then we have the reward. The hero is gifted with a power or some knowledge that will benefit either themselves or the society they left. And finally, we have the return back, resurrection, and return with the elixir. Like I said previously, not every story will hit these exact beats or even in the same order at times. And each of the stages can change with context depending on the story being told. However, before we get into the Spider-Verse film, we're going to take a look at how the monomyth is represented in Spider-Man's origin story. Peter Parker is a high school student who lives with his aunt and uncle. Peter is your typical science nerd who is bullied at school, but he dreams of one day growing up to become a scientist himself. While on a field trip, he is bitten by a radioactive spider and gains superpowers. Peter initially used these powers for profit, competing in a fighting ring to earn cash. While Peter is leaving one day, he notices an armed robber stealing money from the fight organizer and decides not to intervene, telling the police officer that he was done being pushed around by everyone. While coming home, Peter discovers that his Uncle Ben has been shot and killed by an armed thug. Peter chases the man down and discovers that it was the same man he let go earlier that night. From that moment on, he vows to use his powers for good. Depending on the version of Spider-Man, the events might change subtly, but for the most part, the origin story remains faithful to its original structure. Peter begins as a normal high school student. This is the ordinary world stage of the monomyth. Peter is then bitten by a spider and gains powers, the call to adventure. Instead of using his powers for good, Peter uses them for financial gain, refusal of the call. Then Uncle Ben is murdered, which is loss of the mentor. Peter decides to use his powers for good and becomes Spider-Man, crossing the threshold. In only 14 pages of newsprint, the original Spider-Man origin story hits the first few beats of the monomyth perfectly. The origin story not only persists across many different Spider-Man interpretations, but props up as a key plot point in Spider-Verse as well. And now that we know what the monomyth is, and how it connects to Spider-Man as a character, Let's finally take a look at Into the Spider-Verse and how it utilizes the hero's journey. Into the Spider-Verse follows high school student Miles Morales, who, like the original Spider-Man Peter Parker, is bitten by a radioactive spider and gains powers. Like the others before him, Miles will have to undergo many trials in order to become a hero. According to Campbell, the purpose of the hero's journey is to pitch the hero into the realm of the unknown, shed their childhood ego, and become an adult. The superpowers often granted to pubescent youth in these stories are metaphors for the responsibility that comes with being an adult. The adventure begins in the ordinary world, 
This is the place that our hero is familiar with. It represents comfort for the most part. But at the same time, our hero often dreams of leaving it as well. But it won't be long before the hero receives the call to adventure and beckons them to leave their comfort and grow through trials and sacrifice. The call to adventure can come in many different forms depending on the story. In the Spider-Verse film, it presents itself in multiple ways to Miles. Some are related to things happening around and to him, while others are quotes from his mentors or people around him. The most obvious thing would be the radioactive spider that bites him. This is the event that sets in motion everything else preceding it, and it's what gives Miles his superpowers. Oftentimes in superhero media, the discovery and initial utilization of the powers is a metaphor for puberty, a physical and psychological change that happens to all of us. The power itself is a metaphor for adulthood. When a child becomes an adult, they gain more rights in a society, but also responsibility. Where have I heard that before? Remember, with great power, comes great responsibility. This isn't super important to the argument, but I also found it funny that shortly after Miles is bitten by the spider and gains powers, we hear this line. It's just puberty. I don't think you know what puberty is. It's just a small little touch that I love that's both funny and actually directly points out the monomyth. Jumping ahead a little bit, we have a scene in which Miles encounters his universe's Spider-Man. During this meeting, Peter Parker offers to help Miles train to use his newfound abilities, but he unfortunately dies right before that happens. This is something called Death of the Mentor, and it actually happens multiple times in the film. The main Death of the Mentor story beat that we see across all Spider-Man media is the killing of Uncle Ben, but the Death of the Mentor will rear its head again in Spider-Verse, so we'll look at it later much more closely. The last part of the Call to Adventure sequence that I found really interesting comes surprisingly from the Stan Lee cameo. Normally, Stan Lee cameos in Marvel movies are reserved for humor or in-jokes, but in Spider-Verse, it's actually used to communicate a very central theme of the film, as well as the overarching theme of the monomyth itself. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits. Eventually. It seems like such a small line that's meant to be funny, but this line is actually incredibly important. And it's no surprise that the next scene is Miles standing in a crowd of people all wearing Spider-Man masks, mourning the death of Peter Parker. The appearance of many different Spider-Men in the film also ties into this theme, that we could all be Spider-Man. Spider-People? You get it. We could all wear the mask. The final monologue of the movie even says as much. Anyone can wear the mask. You could wear the mask. Next up on our journey, we have the refusal of the call, which sort of plays out in Spider-Verse, but it's debatable. The refusal in this context is more like apprehension about what Miles will have to do. Miles has the key to stopping the interdimensional gate that would rip the city and perhaps the world apart. He stops at the grave of Peter Parker at a low point, not knowing what to do. Peter was supposed to be his mentor that would help guide him, but now he has nowhere to turn for now. At this moment, we meet yet another mentor for Miles, Peter B. Parker, aka Peter Parker from another dimension. Peter isn't exactly the mentor that Miles would have wanted, but it turns out that he's the one that he needs. But not only that, Peter is also not completely finished with his own hero's journey, but we honestly do not have enough time to cover that in this video, so maybe another time. Now that our hero has his mentor and a goal, the adventure finally begins. What continues are the trials that our hero must overcome. For Miles, this is stopping Fisk from using the beam again. In order to do that, Miles will have to team up with others in order to succeed. But first, it's time to meet with the goddess. In the context of Into the Spider-Verse, Aunt May is the goddess. After all, she's the mother figure for Spider-Man across almost every Spider-Man interpretation. She's also the one who gives Miles and the others many of the tools that her universe's Peter left behind when he died. The mythological figure of the Universal Mother imputed to the cosmos the feminine attributes of the first, nourishing and protecting presence. The fantasy is primarily spontaneous, for there exists a close and obvious correspondence between the attitude of the young child toward its mother and that of the adult 
toward the surrounding material world. But there has been also, in numerous religious traditions, a consciously controlled pedagogical utilization of this archetypal image for the purpose of the purging, balancing, and initiation of the mind into the nature of the visible world. Next we come to Miles's loss of a second mentor, that of his uncle Aaron. Like Peter and Uncle Ben before him, Miles loses a father figure close to him, a person with which he felt more kinship to than his actual father. Going through life, we all lose someone. We're all going to die one day and leave many people behind. We might not feel as though we are ready to step out of the real world alone, but in the realm of myth, an event like this signals the point at which the hero must leave and become their own person, whether they feel ready or not. Loss of the Mentor isn't explicitly mentioned in The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and yet you'll find lots of diagrams and other writings about the monomyth that point it out as a step in the process. However, I think this quote from Campbell about fate from his book Reflections on the Art of Living ties into the ideas represented within this often cited stage of the journey. Nietzsche was the one who did the job for me. At a certain moment in his life, the idea came to him of what he called the love of your fate. Whatever your fate is, whatever the hell happens, you say, this is what I need. It may look like a wreck, but go at it as though it were an opportunity, a challenge. If you bring love to that moment, not discouragement, you will find the strength is there. Any disaster you can survive is an improvement in your character, your stature, and your life. What a privilege this is when the spontaneity of your own nature will have a chance to flow. After Miles loses his uncle, he heads into the stage known as Apotheosis. In the film, this is what people would recognize as the what's up danger scene. Our hero has to overcome their fear, and finally has the means with which to combat the evil or slay the dragon power as it's often called. This scene also acts as a callback to a previous scene in which Miles attempts to jump between rooftops and fails. He wasn't ready then, but now he is. Ego is not annihilated in them. Rather, it is enlarged. Instead of thinking only of himself, the individual becomes dedicated to the whole of his society. Having reached apotheosis, the hero finally battles the evil power and wins. Having conquered the evil, our hero returns to the society from which they originally came, now bearing the boon which will help them save the world, or bring about some understanding. Along with this often comes a stage in the hero's journey called Atonement with the Father. For Miles, this happens in a few stages throughout the movie, but I thought I'd discuss it at the end where it actually reaches a crescendo. Earlier in the film, Miles hears his father speaking to him through the door of his dorm room. Later, Miles confronts him as Spider-Man, his father obviously not knowing it is his son under the mask. But nevertheless, the two atone, and a new bond of understanding between them is forged. The ogre aspect of the father is a reflexive of the victim's own ego, derived from the sensational nursery scene that has been left behind but projected before, and the fixating idolatry of that pedagogical non-thing is itself the fault that keeps one steeped in a sense of sin, sealing the potentially adult spirit from a better balanced, more realistic view of the father and therewith the world. Atonement consists in no more than the abandonment of that self-generated double monster, the dragon thought to be God, and the dragon thought to be sin, but this requires an abandonment of the attachment to the ego itself, and that is what is difficult. One must have faith that the father is merciful, and then a reliance on that mercy. Therewith, the center of belief is transferred outside of the bedeviling god's tightly scaly ring, and the dreadful ogres dissolve. And here we reach the conclusion of our hero's journey, Miles having thwarted the evil and becoming a better person in the process. In a section of the book The Hero with a Thousand Faces titled Master of Two Worlds, Campbell writes, The myths do not often display on a single image the mystery of the ready transit. Where they do, the moment is a precious symbol full of import to be treasured and contemplated. I like this quote a lot because it expresses something about media with mythic ideas that I really love and believe in. These stories are important to us, not only because we take joy in them, but because they show us avenues and experiences that we all may face in life one way or another. Into the Spider-Verse is a great example of this, but it's far from the only one. Like I said at the beginning of this video, the hero's journey or the monomyth is not what a lot of people believe it to be. It is not a template from which to craft stories from. Rather, it is the visualization of a pattern, 
a pattern which has played itself out in many stories across the globe for thousands of years and continues to this day. These stories stick with us because in life, we all go through our own hero's journey. We all lose our mentors. We all have to slay that dragon within. And sooner or later, we all have to jump.